My name is Jennifer Gray Thompson, and I am the CEO of After the Fire. Welcome to the podcast, How to Disaster, Recover, Rebuild, and Reimagine. In this podcast, we bring you the very best practices, best hearts, and great ideas from other disaster-affected communities. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to How to Disaster, a playbook to recover, rebuild, and reimagine. My name is Jennifer Gray Thompson, and I am the Executive Director of Rebuild North Bay Foundation. It is my pleasure and honor to introduce you to Charles Brooks, Executive Director of Rebuild Paradise Foundation. Welcome, Charles. Hi, Jennifer. Thanks for having me. I'm so glad to have you because um, for me, this is a very special podcast. You're like my um, disaster brother from another mother. Uh, we've had quite a two years together now. I think it was November 20th, 2018, the first time that we met. So first, I want to talk a little bit about um, Rebuild Paradise Foundation, including like when you were started, what's your mission and vision, and a couple of your programs. And then I want to go back to the origin story of how it is that we came to, to meet, and then we will return more to the um, what you're doing as far as programming is concerned. Does that sound okay? Sounds great. Okay. So tell us about Rebuild North, sorry, Rebuild Paradise Foundation. Well, the Rebuild Paradise Foundation was started shortly after the campfire, which affected Butte County in 2018. It was and is today the most destructive wildfire in California history um, in terms of number of structures lost, a number of lives lost in a, in a wildfire. Uh, it consumed uh, almost 19,000 structures in, in a little over a day and a half in our county, and it ended up being about 14% of the housing stock for our entire county. So uh, it was out of that that I realized that I needed to do something to see our, our community come back. And there was nothing else to do but to help in some way and trying to figure out what that was going to be and and how we could how we could do something meaningful that captured the, the goodwill and the philanthropy and the, uh, the, um, the resources that were pouring into our community immediately after the disaster from around the world and getting that to hold for a long period of time is kind of where my mindset went. And so that really was the, the initial thoughts behind, behind getting that started. And then of course, you came into the picture as I was having those crazy thoughts in, the, in my mind, like, how am I going to do something? And then from there, it was a lot of mentorship and a lot of work with trusted advisors taking this idea and incubating it to a point to where it became an actual organization. Because it's one thing to just have an idea, but to actually do a startup after an unprecedented natural disaster um, and in a new model, too, is really um, quite a challenge. And for our, and our fires are so different now. And one of the things that the, the listeners may not know is that until the campfire, the wildfires that we were created for, which was the 2000, October of 2017 wildfires for Napa, Sonoma Lake and Mendocino, at that point, we were the largest, most destructive uh, wildfire. And 13 months later came the campfire and um, the question of whether or not this could get any worse or whether or not this would continue to happen was answered. And so um, that's why, that's how you came to be. Now, one of the things that um, really motivated you too is not only was Paradise your home, but you lost your home in the fire. Can you talk about that? Yeah, we had lived in the house that we lost for 11 years. Uh, prior to prior to the campfire. And that was going to be the house that we were going to raise our kids and they'd go to high school and then we'd figure out what we were going to do with our life at that point. But it was this great piece of property. It was an old home from the 70s that we worked on, good bones, just needed a lot of help. And, you know, we were working at that. And it was this ideal piece of property that we we loved being at and just was, you know, we have this saying or on the... Our, our welcome sign used to say, welcome to paradise, may you find it to be all its name implies. And, and our property really felt like that to me. It was the one place where I could truly relax when I walked in and sat down on the back deck or sat with my family. And, and so there's a lot of connection to a home and to a community that developed living there. We lived there for uh, in paradise for almost 15 years. Yeah. 
So tell us about the mission and vision of Rebuild Paradise and um, a couple of your programs. Okay, so the mission of Rebuild Paradise is to provide long-term disaster support uh, for the disaster affected residents, businesses and workforce in Butte County. Heavily focused on the campfire right now. We unfortunately have had another disaster uh, with the North Complex uh, Bear Fire this year to where another one of our communities lost uh, almost 2000 structures. And so that uh, we're evaluating tucking that into our programs as they start to, to look at uh, to go from disaster response to long term recovery and seeing if seeing if we have the the ability and the the bandwidth and capacity to to take on that as well. So we're really focused on supporting the residents, businesses and workforce within the community and right now our heavy focus is on residents because commercial survived more than our our residential structures did and so the need to get houses back for people that are displaced for workforce housing and also to, to, to support the, the current businesses that are there is paramount. So most of the services, nearly all the services that we've developed to date is to support residents coming back and, and lowering barriers to entry. Okay, I love that. So, um, okay, I think, you know, when I'm listening to you, it occurs to me that I wanna make sure that the listeners had a, an overall vision of what you do and, and what Rebuild Paradise Foundation is. And then I wanted to sort of begin at the beginning. And so November 20th of 2018, um, uh, somebody reached out to me, Martha Miller, who was, who was a mutual, um, she was an acquaintance of mine and a friend that you went to college with at, at Chico. And uh, she said, you know, I have this friend who wants to help and um, would you mind, you know, connecting with him? Cause I know you're on your way up to paradise. Now, when I saw the plumes of smoke on November 8th um, rise up, we could see that from Sonoma Valley, so from Sonoma County. We were actually doing a groundbreaking that morning. We looked up, we saw this huge plume of smoke and you're pretty far away. You're about three hours from me. And uh, that's when we um, started learning about what was happening in your community. So devastating. And um, so seeing that, I felt really strongly that if we could be of any service to your community, then that's what I wanted to do. If nothing else, just to say, hey, we just went through this. I don't really know if we can be of help, but we're here for you. And um, what I and so we you and I connected, and then the first thing I did was say, well, why don't you come into this meeting with um, the mayor, um, Jody Jones, and the town manager, Lauren Gill. So pick it up from there. How did that go? To say that was uncomfortable would be an understatement. So <laughs> yes, I, I am grateful for the connections that led to you and I meeting, and you to become my disaster sister uh, from another Mister. Does that work? <laughs> it works for me. <laughs> um, so you and I had had one or two phone calls. You were coming up to the area and I'd researched your model a little bit, still major in recovery brain, fire brain, like kind of half there, I guess, right after the disaster, your brain, you're trying everything you can to just focus. And it's really, really difficult. But then you and I meet and we have like two minutes on bench seating before in an old municipal building, like the most uncomfortable bench seats possible. And then we get invited into this office and here is the mayor and the town manager completely exhausted. They have been working 12 days straight, basically 24 hours a day. And, and had lost their homes too. And, it, and um, yeah, and they're just, they're, they're looking at you and they have no idea who I am. I, I had interacted with Lauren on another project, but not in a close context. So I, there was no expectation that she even knew who I was. And uh, then you were describing the process about, hey, we're not here to sell you anything. We just want to help. We learned a lot out of Santa Rosa and out of Sonoma County. I'm here as a resource for you. And also Charles is gonna be here to help you through this. And I wear a, a heart rate monitor. I have a, I have a, a watch, this is my fitness watch has a heart rate monitor. When we got out of that meeting, I went back and looked because I was dead nervous. I was, it was so uncomfortable. And I looked back and my heart rate was like 130 when you, uh, when you said it. it was right around that time and during that short meeting. And I thought, now I'm expected to do something. These ideas that I had and that I talked to you about and talked to a few close people about, about starting this organization, well, you just 
you were the encouragement, whether I wanted it or not, that now we got to perform. Your eyes then, were your eyes were like saucers during that meeting. And then after when you were sitting on the bench again and you were you were still taking notes and I walked out, my sister was with me too. And I walked out, we got into the car. I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I hope he's going to be able to do it, but I don't know. Can you tell us, um, I love this part and I know that you, you give me a little bit of grief for always bringing it up, but I do think it's a really important point about emergent leadership. What did you do before you took this on? I was a sales manager for a reusable bag company. So I basically sold reusable bags to grocers in the Western United States. So it's not uncommon for me to be in a meeting and be presenting to people, talking with people. I'm usually like totally calm in those situations. But when, when you said those words to a town manager and to the mayor, I was, it literally put me in super uncomfortable mode, but that's where growth happens, right? Is being uncomfortable and getting out over your skis a little bit and trying to figure out what the heck you're doing and, and sticking to a plan and going for it. Um, and yeah, so thank you. Well, isn't that funny that I could, I could visit such discomfort upon you and you'd be like, thank you. So thank you for, you know, taking up the mantle and being willing to do it because really it wouldn't matter what I said in that meeting, um, because you could have gone back to your life and just said, you know, I don't have the capacity to do this. And, and for a lot of people, it's not possible, but one of the things in all of our community to community work, and one of the goals of this podcast is to really help people understand that emergent leaders are sort of the secret sauce in um, recovery. And it's great if you, it doesn't mean that FEMA or people who you know have a PhD in disaster recovery aren't super useful because they can be and they are. But if you don't have sort of community emergent leadership carrying or picking up this other side of it, in my opinion, you're not going to recover as successfully. Like, so how did you, so, okay. So here's what I'd like you to talk about now. What were the first six months after your fire? What, um, after your fire, what was that like? Because there's a trauma aspect to it too. You've lost your home. You've had to relocate to Chico. You have two young sons and your and your wife and your dog Ranger. And so, I think that um, sometimes if people see where you are now and you know and rebuild paradise is so successful that you just uh, won nonprofit of the year for your state senate district. So I just want to say that that um, what you've accomplished in two years has been super impressive. So, but it comes in stages. So what were the first six months like? Personally, it was a very, very difficult time. Trying to recover, let it sink in what's happened to your, your whole world and that your, your entire life, your loved ones are safe, but everything that you've worked for and I, and is reduced down to two two bags of clothes. And you know, you've got your family. So thankfully you have the loved ones in your life. But now it's completely starting over. It's navigating insurance, understanding debris removal, looking at the the home that it, it was more than a house, you know, going through that and seeing that and starting to navigate all that. And for me, I threw myself back into work right away because I needed to be busy. And then you have all this other stuff you have to deal with on the side that's part of recovery. Um, and also trying to figure out ways to do good and identify gaps for your organization to, to, to have meaning and starting an organization, starting a 501c3 can be really challenging. And so while working and then discovering what do we have to do to get a 501c3 off the ground? Well, we need a fiscal sponsor. Okay. Well, how do I find a fiscal sponsor? Start doing some research who has the capacity to do that. And in our area, all the nonprofits were, were overtaxed immediately during the disaster. Uh, but I reached out to North Valley Community Foundation and they had, in a typical scenario, they have the ability to incub incubate new organizations and take on fiscal sponsorship. But now they're trying to manage all the incoming philanthropy and basically be the hub for disaster recovery. They started the long-term recovery group out of their organization. Um, and so I'm emailing them and submitting requests. I'm like, how come nobody won't call me back? How come nobody won't call me back? I don't get this. I've got this great idea. I, you know, we want to do something. We want to be supportive. And I walked into their office in mid-December because nobody was calling me back. And I opened the door and there's literally papers flying through the air and there are people running around with phones ringing off the hook and boxes and clothes, like stuff everywhere. And I got it. They were the hub 
there was the place people went with big donations and people wanted to send them clothes and they couldn't take clothes because they're not designed. They don't have warehouse space. And, and they were just inundated and having to staff up so fast to support this, to figure out how they can support this need. And then finally, um, I, I, you know, I stepped way back and said to, to the person in front, I said, if there's anybody that can just call me back, I don't need a lot of time. I just need to see if this is something you can do. And I got, I got through to somebody there ended up making an amazing connection. And this gentleman, Bill Hubbard there, and I have been really close afterwards. And he just, he, he, he helped us through that transition period until we could be a standalone 501c3. So during that time, I'm working regular, my work was being totally flexible and saying, look, we know you need to do this, uh, just get your work done. And, but I still had a travel schedule for work. So I'm flying to Los Angeles. And that first time I flew and left home, and left the ground at Sacramento airport. I literally, if I could have turned that plane around without going to federal prison, I would have turned that plane around because for the first time in my life, I did not want to be, I did not want to go anywhere. I, all I wanted to do was be as close as possible to, to home. And I realized that this is absolutely what I must do. I just have to have, have to figure out how to help the community. And so over those six months for getting a board of directors together, um, starting to develop project ideas, starting to fundraise. And that's another challenge. When you're a new organization and you're standing up, fundraising is very difficult. When, you, when you're trying to operate under another 501c3 and getting large donors interested in what you're doing, but you're not a, you haven't proven yourself. So that is a huge hurdle that once we got our 501c3, a whole bunch of doors opened up. So fundraising to be able to support projects, being able to, to just develop a presence. How are we going to raise money to be able to, to build a website, to do the outreach that we need, just do the simple things. Uh, well, and it's so a little that, bit different model too, which is one of the things that is always a barrier to entry too, is that if it's, if, if it has, if it hasn't been done a whole bunch of times before, and if it's not based in social equity, then it's hard for people to understand. It's easier to give your, your money to something that is, you know, I like dogs too. Like I would like to give all the money and have all the dogs. Um, so that some things are easier than other things to decide to fund. And so how did you frame that conversation um, to your potential funders? Because I know I sat next to you when you were talking to the Red Cross one day and you did a great job. So what advice would you give about that? We were looking for the gaps. And this kind of frames an answer for you. So as we were developing our organization, we're participating in the long-term recovery group. We realized early on that our area that we're probably gonna be able to have based on, on our experience between our board, our advisors, myself, the area where we could probably participate the most in the recovery and, and do the most good is, is around the housing space and helping, helping people get back to housing. Uh, in whatever capacity that looked like. So we started participating with the long-term recovery group in housing committee meetings and some others. And that's where we really started to see the gaps. And I, by identifying those gaps and developing projects that specifically target those gaps, it was a lot easier to have conversations with potential funders that with the programs that we are developing, we anticipate to meet this need that has shown itself in the community. This is how we're going to do it. And this is how many people we're going to impact. Because that's the number one thing that major funders, uh, whether it's American Red Cross, who's pulling in other donor dollars, who's then uh, redistributing that to organizations who are who will make the end goal happen, or whether it's somebody like the Butte Strong Fund through North Valley Community Foundation, same thing. They need the partners on the ground that are going to do the work. We wanted to do that work. So how do we frame these projects as something? What is the deliverable? How many people are we gonna impact? How are we gonna leverage those dollars to have the most impact? Uh, and so we do that in a number of ways through technology and also through attacking um, barriers to entry for just getting to being able to rebuild a lot of the hurdles that come up prior to that. Visit a local manufactured home retailer to get started and ask them about CrossMod Home. Does that qualify for the MH Advantage financing? With customizable layouts and features and surprisingly affordable mortgage financing options, take the first step forward in rebuilding your vibrant community, your town, your paradise with an MH Advantage qualifying home today.
Can you talk about a few of your innovative programs? And I, I do want to interject here and say that um, although we provided mentorship to Charles, we were not able to provide funding because our funds had to be used in the North Bay. So um, I, have, I have nothing to do with your total success in finding funding. And um, but I, so full, full credit um, absolutely goes to you. But um, can you talk about some of your programs? Because one of the things I love about a rebuild model is it's a highly adaptive. It's not prescriptive. Like what's going to work in paradise is not necessarily what's going to work perfectly in another community. But there are elements where I think that you, I know that you have really innovated. And, and I do believe that some of your programs are absolutely scalable to other areas. Sure. And I would say that while you weren't able to provide funding, one of the things that I really, I really focused on early was when you said your disaster is completely different from ours. So what works for us may not work for you, but I'm happy to share with you what has worked. But the other thing that you were able to do is when I was having not as much confidence in my abilities or what we were trying to do as a mentor does, you came alongside me and said, Hey, you are this, you're on the right path and you provided a tremendous amount of support in that area. So it, at that point, funding wouldn't have mattered because now you gave me the, and us the confidence to move forward, to be able to attract the funders that we needed to. So um, just know that that's really important. So if anybody listening to this has, is in that role where they're supporting another fledgling organization, just being there to support and help, help keep them moving is, is, invaluable. Um, as far as our projects go, we Paradise had some unique challenges that popped up in getting to construction. Many communities will face similar things, but we identified some of those hurdles as not only cost hurdles, but mental hurdles. And so if we can provide support in the form of grants in money, but also in, in solving, not really solving some of the problems, but giving people the tools to, to get further down the line, that it will help them mentally as well as, as in cost or as well as financially. Because in a disaster, you have disaster economics and most people are underinsured because they don't really pay attention to insurance. It's not fun. It's not interesting to sit down with your insurance agent every six months and, you know, up your premium. Nobody wants to do that. Um, so many Although people- I on a personal note, I do want to say that I often think of your story that you, your insurance person was somebody you knew personally, and he had insisted about what was it like three months before the fire that you change your insurance policy. Yeah, it was in May of 2018 that I sat down for our annual review and I was like, oh, great here. My buddy's going to try and try and get me for a couple more dollars. But I really listened because he said, this is what we learned out of Santa Rosa. And um, so I really, really listened and I'm grateful to this day that we had that conversation and we added an extra $200 a year to our policy because it helped us recover better than we would have had we not had that adjustment. We still would have recovered, but the picture would look different. And so I'm a big fan of insurance. I'm not here to promote any insurance companies or anything like that, but look at your insurance policy <laughs> and really pay attention because the inevitable could happen to you. Um, but so we're, we're focused on, on pre-construction hurdles and, mm -hmm. and things like in our area, access to water, getting a, getting a backflow device and everybody in the town of paradise has to have their property surveyed. Well, that's anywhere from a thousand to $9,000 to have your property surveyed, depending on the complexity, if it's ever recorded with the county, a whole bunch of things. And then also people are going to have to design a home. So you've got architecture and engineering. So we started kind of cluing into those first couple hurdles that people have to get to before they can put any money into a rebuild. So we developed our first grants program, really focused on a population of the community we call the missing middle. So middle class, lower middle class typically above subsidized housing level, but being able, but below being able to afford market rate housing. The type of people that never ask for a handout, never ask for any help, they just go to work every day, service workers, teachers, you know, frontline workers, the people who, who just typically go to work every day have never asked for anything. So we really are trying to champion this population of the missing middle. And when we looked at the demographics, it's almost 40% of our 40% of our community and our and the town of paradise met this criteria. And we said, let's see how we can incorporate uh, this demographic. And it really hit home with some of our funders. They, they really got it when we were able to describe that demographic. 
And so while we were developing this grants program, I'd always had this idea since we started designing our own home and how much of a like mental exercise it is and how challenging it is, how could we help people with floor plans? So my first thought is, I'm just gonna ask my architect, would he give my floor plans to other people who lost their home? He's like, well, it doesn't really work like that. And he said, I could. He's like, but there's all these things that you have to do to make a floor plan work on somebody else's property. I can't just take your home design and your foundation design and plop it on the next door neighbor's lot because their, their topography is different. There's all these other things. So from that, we started talking about what would it take to get floor plans to work for other people's property. And after months of working with different architects and engineers, we finally put together this plan for a floor plan library. And we wrapped that into our missing middle grants program with this kind of holy trinity idea of if we can get somebody access to floor plans that are so low cost that our grants program would cover that little bit of a cost to create a site plan, and somebody had their water and survey paid for, that's like three of the major hurdles. So now you can put your money into your house. And it was kind of that thought of how do we knock each one of these out? And then, so we developed this floor plan library, take floor plans through master planning with the town and county, which saves time. Now you can get a permit in like two to three weeks because these things have been approved opposed to two to three months of a typical custom home. So you're saving people time, you're saving them money, also on their permit fees are reduced because you're using master plan. So, hey, this is, this is gonna work. So I have to interject and say, taking an idea of how to provide that sort of relief and then actually making it happen, that's a process and that is difficult. It means that you have to work really well with your public sector. So can you just speak a little bit to how you had to develop those relationships in order to even get a program like your, um, your, your uh, library off the ground? Yes, and this is gonna to speak to the value of a long-term recovery group or a collaborative or after a disaster community organizations coming together in a, in a, in a space that allows them to cross collaborate and to have meetings identified by certain needs, housing, uh, shelter, um, spiritual and emotional wellness, um, there's a whole gamut of, of basically committees that come together. And so by participating in, in those committees and, and being very focused on making sure that you're attending those community meetings and being a part of that is really, really critical because that's where I started to develop the relationships with county officials that, and, and town officials that were coming to these meetings to represent what the municipalities were doing. So that's where I had a chance to meet the chief building officer, the person who's in charge of uh, development services, which is where the county uh, reviews floor plans and looks at permits and stuff like that. So making those relationships and your county supervisors and your town council members and, and making those, those relationships and letting them know this is what our plan is. Then when you go in to start asking questions, they're, they know you and they're willing to, they're willing to work with you and so we, we built those relationships across both municipalities. And then when we wanted to take this floor plan library idea forward, now we're having meetings with the chief building official and saying, this is how we plan to move forward. How can we work best with your staff to see that it's, to see that it, it's functional? Because we don't wanna just dump a burden on you. We want you to be part of the process. And so in that, we're now hosting meetings with the design community and also the, um, the county and the town. So now they're, we're having roundtable discussions about how to improve process overall that isn't even affecting our floor plan library. It's affecting everybody in the disaster because we're trying to improve the permitting process. Sorry, that's a little bit into the weeds. but No, I think actually, that's, those are the weeds that I'm looking for because the podcast is called How to Disaster. And um, we're hoping that before you have a disaster, people might be able to pick up parts of this series, but also um, after you have one and certain things, you're not going to be ready for all the information, you know, it takes a minute, but um, other things you might be ready and they, and somebody could be looking at their town, like in town in Phoenix with the Almeda fire, where they, there, I think that there's certain things that you've done that they could adapt really well to their town. But some of the key things like actually listening and figuring out where the gaps are and never underestimate the value of having relationships with your public sector. It's just really important for them to, for your public sector to be open to it 
and to say, oh, okay, you're not going to be um, a burden on us. Because that's one of the things that they fear is you're going to put more work on them. So did you run into that at all? Yes. And it was, it was you sharing that initially and then just being aware of the way that they reacted during conversation. So having kind of uh, that, that social awareness um, of body language and about how people are acting in meetings and seeing that when you bring up an idea and all of a sudden you can see people kind of getting, you know, backing up and you can see them kind of looking around like, oh no, this is going to be a lot, but you circle back with how can we make this to, to not be any more burdensome on you because now you've got a staff of one size at a municipality that typically they can't staff up for a disaster. They don't have the budget to start all of a sudden hiring people to take over things, especially when a good majority of your community has been impacted. So now it's just, what else am I going to have to do? So trying to present these ideas and thinking about how much can we leverage philanthropy, our own knowledge and our own capacity to not put more work on them. And we've developed some incredible relationships with, um, with our county and also with our, um, with our town government to, to where we're a trusted partner that they're willing to work with and give information to and to trust to do, to do good things that are gonna benefit the community. And then you find that staff actually go, go to bat for you to, to go out and get a little bit of grant funding that helps pay for master plan approvals that you were gonna have to go to philanthropy for. Well, the town went out and found a little bit of that to help, help that process go that much smoother because they believe in what you're doing. And so the relationships in, with government is so important. It can't be adversarial. It ha everybody from organizations and, and government have to be rowing in the same direction to be able to, to accomplish big things. Because there is, after all, enough disaster to go around. And um, and I think that one of the things that people run into, and we've just seen this repeatedly, is you have a disaster in the public sector who, who are also undergoing trauma um, are expected to um, fix all the problems that, were, that they were already attending to and at the same time deal with this massive, unprecedented disaster. So they naturally start to con, you know, become more um, contracted into themselves and, and they can be more uh, defensive initially um, because also the public is sort of often takes their trauma out on the uh, public officials because they have to stand up before the public and listen to them. And so, um, I, you know, we like to always advise that you actually can't get these things done without relationships in the public sector. I just don't see how it's possible. I would agree. And on that note, actually, I wasn't, I've, I've forgotten that we could talk about this, but um, one of the things that we did together was, and um, speaking of the public sector, is um, we shared our advocacy model with you. And um, I was very proud. Uh, there was this moment a little over a year ago, a year and three weeks ago, where we were sitting in the Speaker of the House's um, uh, chambers in D.C., and you were there and you were talking to uh, Speaker Pelosi about some of the challenges. And then we also had representatives from Paradise meet with uh, the, a Republican uh, minority leader, Kevin McCarthy at the same trip. And the day before we met with all of the agencies and you were able to speak very eloquently about um, some of the challenges in Paradise. Can you talk about that trip a little bit? So that was definitely one of those, Jennifer's pushing me outside my comfort zone, but I know this is gonna be good because never in my life did I think that I would ever be doing anything in, in I didn't even understand the term advocacy until uh, I'd learned from your model and the value that it can bring to a community. But having the opportunity to take our community's message to the federal level and directly speak to agencies and organizations that were gonna affect the outcome of our recovery and other communities like ours. We went as a group of disaster affected Northern California counties that were all facing similar challenges. So leading up to that trip, it was meetings with uh, leadership at, um, at the town level and also at the county level to understand what are, what are like three top priorities that when we meet with HUD, we meet with FEMA and we meet with elected officials, what do you want us to support? Showing that kind of private and public partnership of we're gonna go there and we're gonna amplify the message and the needs of our community and then also share a couple of the true life stories of what we're going through and to have the ability to sit down and connect with lawmakers who you only see on TV or you see their name as a byline in a, in a news article uh, was really meaningful and, and 
to be able to share the stories of the community and, and have it make an impact to where staffers, after you get back, are reaching out because they want data, they want details, they want to know how a particular piece of legislation or a challenge that we're facing might be, they might be able to tackle that in upcoming legislation. And one of the things I really loved about that trip is that you all were able to talk about more eloquently than we had actually the issue of tree removal and so much of the federal administration's response to um, disaster is based in wind and rain events and it's not actually based in wildfires. And so can you talk a little bit about the impact of being able to carry that message forward about the dire necessity to fund tree removal? Yes, and for a little piece of perspective, after the campfire, it was estimated in Paradise alone that there were 750,000 to a million trees that were dead or dying. And we're talking about big trees, 150 foot tall ponderosa pines, gorgeous trees that are all burnt to a crisp that are now standing upright that in heavy winds will fall on either a house that's being rebuilt or a standing home, one of the, you know, one of the 7% of the standing homes we had left in the town. And that, that was a huge part of, of the recovery that we needed to solve. And up until then, FEMA did not include tree removal. They included debris removal. So getting rid of the, the debris from a house that's burned down, but trees were not part of it. And it took months and months of focused effort between our fire safe council, our town, our county governments, our state officials, our federal officials, and our efforts of going to FEMA and going there and saying that the number one priority in our community right now is trees. Because these trees in another year are gonna fall on people and they're gonna fall on houses being rebuilt and they're gonna block roads and they're going to kill people. And this needs to be part of disaster recovery. And that was a, that was the one of the most unified messages that has come out of our disaster is trees. And now the FEMA handbook has, and I forget what page number it is, but now communities that meet criteria in disaster can have tree removal as part of that because everybody was rowing in the same direction and the connections that were made at the local state and federal level, everybody pushing on this issue together, community organizations, individual community members, nonprofits, local government, county government, state and federal officials all realizing that this has to happen and enough pressure was applied. What once was a no became a yes. And tree and removal just started two years later. It just started last week. Oh my God. Oh, congratulations. That's awesome. But I, you know what I love about it too is that you know anything that has um, anything that amplifies or, or helps people as they move forward too. So you were able to help your own community. But one of the things I love most about that is that you actually changed what recovery will look like for our newly fire affected communities. In fact, you know Sonoma County is also yet again every year a newly fire affected community, and and now Butte too um, on the uh, not in Butte County but the Bear Creek fire they're going to have an easier time because of the efforts that you put forth. And those people are accessible to you. Um, like I'm not, you know, I wasn't anybody special necessarily. I mean, we have connected board members, but um, advocacy we feel has to be a part of every community's recovery and, and rebuild. Because if you don't advocate for yourself and if you, and part of that uh, cross collaboration of sectors is a really important part of it. But no one's going to go on your behalf if you don't um, call out what the problems are and where the improvements can be made in our experience. And I think that we, yeah, we were all in that one um, head meeting together where uh, the woman who was leading it said, we love this model. Like we love that there are foundations at the table, there's private sector, there's public sector, and it's regional. This is exactly the kind of model that you should be using. And, and so I really want, you know, I'm so, so pleased by that experience. And I applaud you for making such a big difference in tree removal. Seems simple, but it's not, and it's really important. It's, and I've taken your introduction to advocacy and I adapt that word advocacy to so many other parts from an individual advocating for them and their family. Yeah. It, it just was a term that was not in my regular regular use, but now it, it's applicable in so many different parts of disaster, not, not just on the legislation and, and federal and state level advocacy, but on the individual working with your insurance companies all the way throughout disaster, advocating for your street, 
your neighborhood, your community, um, those those things, advocating with your with your local supervisor. Like there's there's so much to that. And I'm so, so grateful that that was that was introduced to us and brought to our attention, because now I look forward to a post covid world when we can take our next set of challenges as disaster affected northern California and fire affected communities, as well as paradise and saying this is what's important. And these are the pieces of legislation that are going to make a difference. And I think it's really important that you're not just showing up to complain, like you're really actually showing up saying we will work with you, we'll provide the data to say, you know, this policy change makes sense. Um, it will save lives and and here and we'll work with you all the way through. So I think that that's really important. I do think that one of the things that gets in the way for many people is they just hear the term lobbyist. And what they don't what they don't see is that everyone has a lobbyist. Like if you donate to the ACLU, they have a lobbyist. If you love the NRA, Lord, the, Lord they, they have lobbyists. Um, but there's also, you know, lobbying can be for good. And lobbying is really about advocating for uh, what your community needs and making changes that will actually change the trajectory of how you recover and rebuild. So I'm so glad that uh, we were able to introduce you to that. I do want to say on a side note that every nonprofit needs to keep their um, advocacy and lobbying um, below 20%. And that includes perceived impact. So we keep ours between 2 and 5% of our resources. And so just as a side note, do talk to a nonprofit attorney. Um, we are not attorneys. We do not give legal advice, but I do want to flag that that is an, a necessity to um, stay in line with the uh, IRS, keep them happy. So um, one of the things, let's see, can you talk about some of the uh, changes and challenges without being too, I don't mean to, you know, crawl into your personal life too much, but I know that um, from my experience in my own family that um, and I don't think it's unusual at all that you have this disaster, it happens, it's very traumatizing, like at Rebuild, we don't even hire people who didn't experience the disaster, because you can't, um, you can't explain what it's like if someone's never been through it. But if you decide to become of service to recovery in the disaster, there are certain things that I think that I'm sure you've learned in two years, and I've learned in three years, because I'm only a year ahead of you that um, finding the balance and dealing with the trauma and then also being of constant service to disaster over a long period of time requires some strategies. And so can you talk a little bit about your own personal journey through that? Yes, and that is that is something that whether you, you're standing up in leadership, you know, or having this conversation about, about this model and, and about um, how to disaster, um, but even on an individual level, there's so much to do that you have to find a pace that is tolerable. You can, in the beginning, you're just trying to get everything done. You got notebooks, you got paper, stuff's flying all over the place. You're really trying to get everything done because you feel like there's, there's just this impending time limit that, that it just has to be done. And there are certain things that have to be met, but once those things are met and you get through that initial rush, it's like, okay, what can I sustainably do? What pace can I keep this going? Because you're going to find times where you push and push and push and all of a sudden things in your life, health and other things start becoming affected because you've just gone too far and you can look at other, you know, other parallels in your life that you might have experienced before where you do that. But when you're, when you're trying to deal with trauma at the same time, it only exaggerates that. And so as much as you want to constantly give and you have to figure out where you can be successful in giving instead of just always showing up. Because if you always show up and you don't, you don't find a place to, to kind of commit and stick a, stick a flag in the sand, you're not going to be able to, you know, you're just going to be scattered, always running in different directions. And you're going to see the next thing that you can jump in and, oh, I may know how to do that. Or I could go and I could go and give that person, you know, $50 but I just took an hour and a half away from my mission and my focus of trying to do this larger thing because I know I can do that and I can help. It's, I do this a lot in conversations with people who are, are working to access our grants or our floor plan library is they start, asking, they start asking me questions about other parts of their recovery. And I could spend two hours on the phone with them going through that, but I know there's people that are better equipped to help them with those type of questions, even though I know I could be of service to them and I want to be, oh, God knows I want to be of service, but I'm just now taking two hours away from forwarding on and getting another floor plan into the library that could help a hundred households. 
And so I kind of have to get in that mindset and it, and it really, it's hard to deal with sometimes because you want to help everybody, but at the same time you need to focus and then you need to find this pace that, that you can work within and take time to figure out what recharges your batteries. Mm -hmm. So I now don't do any social media on the weekends. I won't take in any social media on the weekends because what I was finding is it was affecting my ability to, to focus on work and family. And so if I was doing it on the weekends, it was definitely affecting family life because I was caught up in what was going on at work and how social media affect, you know, the things that are going on that I need to focus on for work. And now I'm taking time away from the people that are most important in my world, which is my direct family. And so I, I'm learning the boundaries and I'm still learning to this day because we have these seasons where we go through and we're super busy, 10, 12 hour days. And you realize I can't keep this up forever because now I couldn't help my kids with their homework or take care of that responsibility. And I'm making shortcuts at home, just trying to get by instead of doing the things that I need to, to be a, you know, to be a responsible parent. So just find that pace. And I, that's a lot of examples, but at the same time, it's all about finding your pace that you can deal with and then figuring out ways to recharge your batteries. So you can, so you can keep going. I think those examples are really important. I think that we've both seen people sort of crash and burn post-disaster because you know, one of the things that it, uh, heals our trauma is helping. And um, if you go too far, then you're actually, um, you become, you become, you don't, you're not useful anymore. And I've seen several people from our community. Um, some people have managed to do it and um, several people have not managed to stay in the helping game. And some have had um, issues with substance abuse or have gotten very ill. And it's, and these are wonderful human beings who can no longer be of service because they just, they ran themselves straight into the ground. So very, or they imploded in some way, you know, and um, so helping the helpers or having, you know, having to figure that out. I know that it's certainly been a journey for me. We've had a lot of conversations about that, um, where just figuring out like meditation, breathing, you're a runner. So I'm sure that that's helped you somewhat too. Yeah, I've gotten a lot of gotten a lot of frustrations out and a lot of challenges out on the long run. Um, and then I will say the other thing, whether you're recovering personally or whether you're you're in a role uh, in disaster recovery, having a disaster buddy is what I call them. So if you're one of my disaster buddies that I can call when I just I I don't know what to do, and I'm basically at the end of my my mental bandwidth and like. I just, I need to talk to somebody who gets it or somebody that can step in and give me a little bit of a nudge one direction or another. And when you're recovering individually, that person needs to be a non-trauma affected person uh, that can help you through things that you just don't have the, the ability to take on at that time. But in our world and in our roles, having somebody that you can call who gets it is so helpful. So I'm putting my you can share my contact information if there's somebody out there who's in this world that just wants to chat for half an hour about what's going on in their world. Happy to listen because it's so helpful to, to have that, have the ability to have that conversation. I really appreciate that last year was, uh, I, you know, I had a couple of incidents that were pretty tough and, um, and it made me like question my sanity in doing this work and doing public work. And I know that um, our phone calls, when you, when you'd be like, you're Jennifer Gray Thompson, you know, that was like, Oh, okay. I think I, I could roll you in my head later. And so, although, yes, I mentored you for the first year, I've really valued the last year. I mean, all of it totally, but um, really you gave me a ton of help last year. And I just want to really thank you for that. And I, I, and I totally agree on the disaster buddies. Like you need your people to help yeah. carry you through. I do want to touch on one thing because not everybody's had this experience so far, but the value added, and I'm not required to say this at all, but of um, bringing Fannie Mae to your community. I, and, 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 you know, I remember like meeting them really early in Santa Rosa for breakfast and they were on their way up to paradise. They're like, what do we need to know? And it was um, Tim and Michael. And can you talk a little bit about why, um, you know, investment in people and investment in community, emotional and fiscal um, has made a difference, especially in that strange market that people don't really think about, which is the mortgage underwriters and how to sort of um, build the momentum so that people will build back in a community like Paradise, especially one that had a number of manufactured and mobile homes in it. So I'll start with the fact that when I heard that two people from Fannie Mae were coming to see me uh, that wanted a meeting, I was like, why does a mortgage company or like a mortgage 
underwriter. I didn't even really know. I just knew the name Fannie Mae. Like it was just some thing that was out there. Um, same, I had, by the way, same exactly for me. And then they showed up and I was like, mm, I love and, it. And I was like, what are, why? I, I didn't get it. And then they came in and two of the nicest people I've, I've met sat in, you know, and, and we talked for like three hours about the campfire, what had happened, what are some of the challenges that we're seeing right now? And they said, hey, we're part of the, the disaster response network at Fannie Mae. And this is how we just want you to know we're here to help. So as you see these challenges, let us know because there are things that are going on that you're working on that have larger impact than you realize. And the importance of sta stable home ownership, we always kind of understood it, but they put it in a context that helped you understand the work that you're doing provides more than you may realize in that path. And then they also were able to support some of those projects that, that there might be a part of the project that is, that's, that's tough to, to figure out how am I going to, you know, how am I going to fund this? How am I, who's really going to understand this component and the impact that it has on it. And they're able to see how that directly affects stable housing and that world. And so it was an opportunity to, to partner with somebody, at least for us, we're able to partner there. They, they saw the vision of the floor plan library before any other funders did. And they said, we get it. This makes sense. This helps people get back into homes. So we want to be one of the first people to support the idea. And that allowed us to take it further. And it was because two people sat and listened and paid attention to what our challenges were and saw an opportunity where what they do can help. And, and that's really how I see Fannie Mae as a, as, a, as a partner that just looks for ways to support and to help and to help get stable housing back to the community. And ultimately that means more mortgages and, and you know, is, part, is part of their world, but they didn't come at it from a perspective of, we need to get more mortgages, how can you help us? It's, we recognize that disaster is a huge impact on a community and safe and stable housing affects people across the entire spectrum from renters all the way through to, to homeowners. And, and how, how can we help? I totally agree. I, uh, I always feel like sort of pleased uh, because I had the same reaction as you when they first wanted to come here. I, I was like, why? And then after I'd spent the day with them, I, I went, oh, okay, I think I get it. But I don't even think that I understood completely the value that they would bring to it. And they don't do grants. They can do scope of work and they can, you know, do some sponsorships, but they don't even do. So they're asking for an actual return on their investment. Um, I know that they're underwriting um, some of the uh, work that I'm doing with other communities right now. And so just, just wanted to give them a shout out because I know that they also work to underwrite the first five mortgages for Paradise to make sure that other lenders and other backers would then come along. And um, so I really appreciate them. And I appreciate how good your relationship is with them. And it's completely separate from me um, as, I, as the design is for every newly um, disaster affected community. So. I think yeah. They're, yeah, they're amazing people. We strongly believe in the model of rebuild. And one of the things that I love so much is that I feel quite proud that in some ways you are proof of concept, even more so than we are, because we were the first rebuild and rebuild can have many different names and it doesn't have to be, you know, rebuild paradise or rebuild North Bay, but that sort of long-term um, recovery to re recovery model that is, um, not a social equity organization, but certainly from your actions, you have increased social equity in your, in your area. Um, what would be your first bits of advice to somebody who's just experienced a disaster and they too want to step up and maybe create something like us or like you um, to benefit their community? And also include in there, please, how you chose your board. Okay. I would start with, as soon as possible, find the collaborative space where organizations are meeting to talk about meeting the needs of the community, whether it's immediate disaster response, whether it's, uh, you know, 
short term and then the, the groups that are meeting to talk about long term solutions for the recovery of your community get involved and start paying attention and meeting people and networking. You've got to get out there and start seeing who else is doing this work because the last thing you want to do is be doing the exact same thing as another organization that is operating in the same space because donors and funders are not going to be excited about that if they're spending money and another and there's somebody else doing the exact same thing. So really get connected. Get connected from day one. Find 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 mentorship and people that you've worked with before on on projects. If you have, maybe it's an maybe it's an old boss, or find an organization like like ours or like Jennifer's that you could reach out to, and just start asking questions. Because chances are, somebody like Jennifer and myself are going to take the time. We're going to recognize what's going on, and we want to spend the time with you because we know how valuable it's going to be, um, and how you're going to need that support, and you're going to need the ongoing support. And so really you've got to find a, you've got to find who else is doing work in the area. What are they doing? How can you identify gaps? Where do you want to work? What space are you confident in, or at least have knowledge in that you, that are a direction that you, you think you want to go. And then, so you want to pull together a board of directors and that is going to be unique to your community. That's going to be unique to you. You want to find at least in my experience, you want to find a board of people that compliments and challenges you all at the same time, but are people that are proven to work well with others and that that have a lot of connections across um, across the community. So look for people that are already serving on another board that may that may be a community organization or uh, that are that are connected in the community through private industry but they're at a level maybe they're a rotarian or maybe they're they're in some other service organization that that they have a a, a reach well within the community and other business leaders and other community organizations so you get that you get a built-in network when you select your board don't just find people that you like find people that are going to get work done that do good work in the community and that you can have a mutually respectful relationship working with that also are going to challenge you that are going to sit down with you and say this is based on where you want this organization to go that's not a good direction but here's a direction that you might consider and find people who are willing to work because it's a very long slog it is you know it's well past the selfie moment when you're doing this work and a lot of the stuff that you start at the beginning really won't come to fruition for a full year after you've started your organization because it's there's so much to do in the meantime that is really um, short-term recovery and that may not be the area you're going to be most successful in because this is uh, much more built for long term but even like you're you know you have this great idea for the um the architectural plans, and then you start to to implement it or you start to design it. It really takes about a year from design to implementation. Um, maybe you can get it done in six to eight months, but for the most part, that's going to be a little trickier. So you have to have um, a dedication to the game, like complete dedication, and um, and also to be um, flexible as far as like maybe you're you know some of the ideas that i've come up with or things that i thought would work weren't necessarily exactly what the community needed like we designed this really nice website but it wasn't what the community needed a year later when it debuted and so some of the lessons are more expensive than others but um, i do think that saying uh, mistakes is really important do you want to identify a mistake that you feel like you made i just made one of mine i just showed you one of mine oh i've made a lot of a lot of mistakes along the way but the fortunate thing is, is that you learn if, if if you're willing to learn from them a lot of good stuff comes from that time to implementation is is something that you never get right and if you do my hat's off to you i, I thought the floor plan that. library was going to be up and running in in six months based on conversations with design professionals it hasn't hit its stride until just now and we're a year and a half since we started working on that idea and started putting the pieces together the website's been designed and working fine but it's getting everybody going and yeah there were covid delays but there you have to keep working at something you have to have that long-term vision and this is going to work i know it in my heart and my soul that this is going to work and be willing to figure out ways to overcome objections because the first handful of architects i talked to no, you can't do that. I wouldn't be willing to do that. You're crazy. That's, you know, there's too much liability. There's this, there's that. 
But once you listen to what the challenges are and you're open to listening and you get them to expand upon that, then you realize there's something I can tackle. There's that little thing. And if I could move that a little bit, then something's going to happen. So that, that long-term thought process. So I put out there that we were going to have 10 floor. I remember at a community event where somebody was donating money to us and the press was there. I said, we're going to have, you know, five building plans within by the end of the summer. And that was last summer. Because I was going on this expectation that that's what the design professionals were telling me we could pull off. Didn't come close. Didn't even like totally overshot it. And here I am, that goes through my head to this day is the fact that I said in front of a large group of people, including one of our donors, that we would do this by this date. So be very careful with dates and be very careful what you promise. Unless you know you can deliver something and especially to disaster affected individuals, do not promise something that you are not going to deliver on. There is enough letdown and enough heartbreak and disaster that people don't need to hear that you're going to solve all their problems and then you don't. So be oh careful. Oh my God. That's yes. And to remember that it's it, of all of the communities to not, um, to let down a disaster affected community is the last one you should be. And that's, and, and it really, it's just the whole spectrum of who's involved there. Like if you say you're going to do something and even if it takes a lot longer to do, you actually need to do it. And uh, because the three types of people who show up post-disaster are those who want to defraud you, those who want to sell you something, and those who want to help you. And figuring out who those, who's where and what is incredibly difficult. And unfortunately, on the balance, those who are going to help you for the long term is a smallish percentage of those groups. So I, I but you did deliver, and that's what matters. What matters is that you and, and you learned that, which I had to learn that way too, thinking that something was going to take, you know, I remember I was like, I want to build this mile of common fence in six weeks. And it took like 14 months. So very important. The last thing I want to actually touch on with you is um, pay it forward. When the campfire happened, um, it was a human response to want to go and help and be of service and to do, you know, to try to make the pain go away a little bit. It's very, it's, it's like a, almost like a trauma response. Um, but I, so I didn't know that pay it forward would become such a big part of, of what we do here at Rebuild. I had no idea. And really you were my first experience with that. And then the Woolsey fire happened on the same day. So I reached out to you and then to the Malibu Foundation. And that took up, you know, became part of my work plan for the next year, which I'm very proud of and, and super and like wonderful. We got a ton out of it. And um, now what I've asked of you is, is that I ask you to get on calls with newly fire affected communities and to share some of your knowledge, which is in part what this podcast is about. But then we also have this other program that's community to community. So I wanna thank you for showing up. And if can you just tell me um, what the value of paying forward some of your lessons is? It's a cathartic experience. And it's also something that it's part of that you just want to serve and you just want to, you want to help. So when you see another community going through what you went through, it brings back so much that you can see it on their faces. You can see it in the way that they talk, the questions that they ask. And if anything you learn can benefit somebody to speed up the process, make it easier, make it, make it hurt less, whatever it is, then, then paying it forward is the only way to go. I, I don't know any other way to say it other than it's the only it's the only thing to do once you've gained this experience, because otherwise it's, we did all this work. Great. Look at us. We did all this work. Yay. We're so great. That, that's lame. Like <laughs> I, 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 there's no other way other than sharing what you've done. And because people, if it helps, I, I, I don't know, it's, you just want to you just want to make it easier on people because it sucks so bad. <laughs> it does because it sucks so bad. It's really uh, traumatizing. It resets your world. Like whatever happened the day before, and it's also knowing that you don't get your like in our case, you don't get your November seventh back. We don't get our October eighth, two thousand seventeen back. Um, but if we can um, help other people through that, you know, if we can take all of our lessons and sh exactly what you said, shorten their pain period so that they can move forward um, better, safer, greener, faster, whatever their goals are, then it's an, I, I find it to be um, incredibly gratifying. And I'm so glad that you're along the journey with, with me, and that, um, we get, that we've continued this uh, relationship. And I do super value you as my um, disaster brother. 
And I'm just really thankful to, to know you and the work that you're doing for your community. And I look forward to many more years of doing this work together. Is it, is it showing on the camera? <laughs> it big does. heart, big heart. <laughs> I'm, I, I can't imagine my world without the amazing people I've met since this disaster. And you are number one on that list. There are people that I, in my own community that I never knew I probably passed them in the grocery store a hundred times or at the hardware store. And there's just so many amazing people that have come out of this. And I am so grateful that you said the things that you did in that meeting that day. And they, that you sat outside on that uncomfortable bench with me prior to that meeting. And then afterwards, and basically we'll figure this out and we'll get you there. And Nothing, nothing but love and admiration for, for who you are and all you've accomplished and, and the places you will go and the people's lives you will help make better. So keep being, keep being you. I feel the same way about you, Charles. And um, really, it's an honor and a privilege to work with you and to have um, gotten you to this moment and for all of this um, support and um, care that you've provided to Rebuild and to me. And so I look, you know, it's going to be great. And I, and I know that this is, you know, just the beginning of other wonderful things. And so thank you so much for taking this time with us to record this podcast. And um, I guess that's it. We'll call it a wrap. Thank you. It was an honor to be on the call with you or on the podcast with you, Jennifer. Thanks. Thank you for joining us on the podcast, How to Disaster. For more information, please visit our website at afterthefireusa.org. And if you liked this video, please hit subscribe.